Welcome to Rocket Punch Radio University. I am Master Sympathist James, and I will do my best to get you expelled. To my left, we have the elusive Samantha, who knows all the secrets of the Underthing. <laughs> Hello. To my right, you may meet young Nate, who will one day unlock the secrets of the Chandrian and the Doors of Stone. Hello there. Hi, guys. How you doing? I'm doing good. pretty good. How are you? Super good. I'm doing quite well. Young Master Nate has managed to finish the first book of the Kingkiller Chronicles, Patrick Rothfuss's The Name of the Wind. And so, since I'm always dying for people to talk about <laughs> these books with, uh, I thought I'd bring them on, and I would also bring on the other person that I've coerced into reading this book so that we can talk about it. I'm so excited. Yay! <laughs> You, you Hi it, guys! You make it Are sound you ready? like we're not always here. We're always here. You're always here, but you're not always reading the books that I'm reading, and I don't get to talk about books with people. That's because we're not you, James. We're our own people. Nobody <laughs> reads the shit that I read. It's you re sad. That's not true. I read some of the shit that you read. Only when I force it on you. I read other shit too, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, James has been positively salivating since Nate's been reading this book. I, I, uh, it's, I listened it's to the audio book. It's wonderful. Like, so. It's like getting a peek into my reading it for the first time again. It's so good. Yeah. It's delicious. <laughs> but yeah, so so Nate, how how did you like it? Uh, I actually loved it. Yeah. I, yeah. I thought it was really good. Um, should we talk about uh, the premise of the book, first of all? Yeah, sure. So, Samantha, why don't you cover this? Okay, so um, it's been it's been like what six months, eight months since I read the book, but I'll do my best. Uh, so, Kvothe is a precocious child who has a wonderful teacher and a happy family who get horribly destroyed in a. Uh, mystical event in which he is the only survivor. Well, the teacher doesn't then, get killed, and it ruins his life. Yeah, but his teacher. His doesn't basically, get the whole book is the long, convoluted way in which that one event ruined his life. Yeah, but okay. So, so first he loses his parents tragically, and then he's a wastrel in the city where he loses the last vestiges of his old life tragically, and then he gets revenge, and then he goes to school and becomes Harry Potter for a while. And then he meets a girl and fights a dragon. Uh, and that's it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that was the plot. That's <laughs> really okay. So kind of the concept of the book is that it is a fantasy book that is the recollections of a an infamous killer uh, telling the it's it's a man for whom many myths have been made. And uh, a historian getting the rare opportunity to sit down with this man who has been presumed dead and to get the real story from his lips. But one of the great things about it is, is that Kavoth is kind of a bastard, so it's unreliable <laughs> narrator. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that you wanted me to tell the story the way Kvothe would want me to tell it. <laughs> I was telling the story the way I, I, I wanted. I was giving a concept of the book rather than uh, giving a synopsis of the book. Let me, let me give a brief synopsis of Quoth's, char Quoth's character. He's a massive egotist. And I love him. He's love blowing him so his much. whole story up into this massive uh, b legend that he's telling himself. And my favorite parts of the book after a long absence from it, were those moments where he stops with the bloviating and actually is his true self. When you can actually see who he is behind all of the, you know, fantastical recollections of his wonderful, you know, life. So I think uh, probably one of the things, everything that I love about Kvothe can be summed up in one particular quote from the book that ended up being used on the back of the book. Uh, <clears throat> I have stolen princesses back from sleeping borrow kings. I have burned down the town of Trebon. I have spent the night with Felurian and left with both my sanity and my life. I was expelled from the university at a younger age than most people are allowed in. I tread paths by moonlight that other men fear to speak during the day. 
I have talked to gods, loved windmen, and written songs that make minstrels weep. My name is Quoth. You may have heard of me. I just, I love that quote. He's like, such an egomaniac, though. When I read that, I was like, fucking, I'm buying all in on this. I am completely in on this book. You know why I oh, like yeah. that for the back of the book? I I think it's I think it's a great back of the book quote because it assumes it it clearly creates this world that has so much more going for it. You get you understand the ideas that he's talking about, but like there are interesting things in that that he's mentioning that you don't know anything about. So like as a as a quote for the back of the book, it's like an excellent one to draw you in. That said, he doesn't tell you about hardly any of that shit. In fact, I don't think he tells you about any of that shit in this book. Uh, in the that burning book, of, Tra- no. of uh, Trayvon. Yeah, yeah, it mentions Trayvon and the, the Barrow Kings. Sort okay, of. Okay, sort of. <laughs> but yeah, that, the, I think uh, the most impressive thing about this book as on the whole is how little of his story is told in it. I mean, how old do you think narrator Quoth is? I think they imply that he's about 25-ish. Yeah. That, that's what Chronicler uh, assumes. Yeah. When he's... Uh, so the guy recording his story is named Chronicler. He's actually named... Uh, what is it? Is it Damien? I is don't that remember. His name? Something I like... Don't he's remember. like... He's like the this like super famous historian, and he uh, like he records the book. Like both read one of his books at university. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, and um, so this guy, uh, you know, he's recording, and he like thinks to himself, like, how has both you know has Kvot done all this stuff? He doesn't look older than twenty five. Yeah, but I don't <laughs> think that he's not like it doesn't. I don't feel like the timeline matches up very well. Yeah, yeah, so maybe he just ages well, or who knows, maybe he found something that makes him look younger. Yeah, he knows the, he knows the name of aging. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so if we want to, speaking of that, if we want to talk about a little bit of the, uh, say, the science of the book, so to speak. Yeah. Oh my god, these are just, oh, so, oh man, Rothfuss did magic so good. <laughs> James, I think you'd be able to uh, explain this best. Okay, so there are several different kinds of uh, arcane kind of mystical, like we would call them a magic in our world, but a lot of these function more like they're they're just, they're physics for the people of this particular world. Uh, One of the primary ones is called sympathy, uh, which is just, you know, basically a lot of it is, is just, you know, two things that are alike, you can bind them together, and then what happens to one happens to the other. It's a lot of information about uh, transfer of energy and the laws of thermodynamics. Yeah, it's a little it's a little yeah. bit uh, thermodynamics, a little bit uh, quantum entanglement. And it's so well thought together. <laughs> it's just so good. <laughs> but then there's also other stuff. You know, there's there's alchemy, and there's there's, you know... Uh, a sigildry, which is basically like magical rune scribing, and all of this stuff is completely commonplace depending on what part of the world that you're in. But then there's just something beyond that that even they're like, "Whoa, I don't believe in that. That's some mystical ass bullshit." And that's you know naming, which is you figure out what the name of a thing is, like what its true name is, and then you have power over it. And it all starts out when when. Kavoth, hearing the story of a powerful wizard, decides that he wants to learn one of the the wizard's uh, most famous abilities. He knows the name of the wind, and the wind comes whenever he calls it. And, yeah, it's, it's, oh my goodness, this is, like, Brandon Sanderson often goes on and on and on and on about the importance of coherent and consist- or consistent and understandable magic system. He does. And he does. He does. Because uh, I, and... I recently read a book by him, and... <clears throat> <laughs> that's like, that's the stuff that he's well known for, is, is his talking about that. And and I feel like Rothfuss okay. basically accomplished that and so much more. 
Yeah, can we, so... Can we talk about the fact that the whole naming thing is almost completely analogous to the way magic is done in uh, the Wizard of Earth sea books? Like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that there too. I mean, that's 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 those, how those are those are real folklore things about magic. Yeah. that's that's deep, you know, in our world stuff. I feel like I feel like that naming thing. Like, if you if you know something's true name, then you have power over it. Thing is a pretty standard magical trope. Yep. Um, uh, it's used in an episode of Doctor Who, actually, as well. It's used in it's used in those bad prophecy movies because somebody learns the true name of Jesus and can unmake the world because they know the name of God. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's a that's a pretty standard. They figured thing. out what the H and Jesus H Christ stands for. Yeah, they did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I think uh, the fact that it's all it, one of the it's hard not to compare the magic school because okay let let's let's get this out of the way first i found the first quarter you know uh, part of the book where he's being trained and he's got his family i found that really interesting i agree when he becomes an orphan waifling in the city that was the point at which i was like ugh, okay i'm gonna i'm I, i gotta get through this um uh, also yeah i uh <laughs> you know me and james mentioned this in uh in our you know podcast group chat where i i just hate this trope like it doesn't do anything for me at all yeah i you know? i kind of agree i feel like it's a very well used thing um and i and i feel like i've read lots of stories about like waiflings in the city mm-hmm. especially in fantasy novels i don't oh, really yeah. know why that is but there, just it's not a point, twist when it happens. Right. Just at the point I got really tired of it, Rothfuss actually took us someplace more interesting, mm-hmm. the college. And so the, mo- the majority of the book, the majority, the meat of the story all takes place in the college, which is an actually really interesting setting. He so, knows how far to go with it. Yeah. yeah. I, I could have done without the wafling thing. I know it's important to his character, but I also just like, I don't know. There's just something about, there's something so misery lit about that. Uh, you know, oh, he's in the city. He doesn't have anything except for his violin, and then his violin gets taken from him, and he has to have revenge. Like that's such a like, that felt like such a like a white oleander, you know, misery lit kind of garbage thing to me. That it was a little bit tiresome. But like, man, y'all are y'all are too cynical for me. It broke my heart. You haven't read as much misery lit as I have, though. <laughs> I did not realize that was the name of a genre. Oh, yeah. All those books that your mom really likes that that are, like, really sad stories about girls who just have really abusive, terrible childhoods, that's misery lit. I don't know if that's a real genre or what they call it, but I think they actually call it lit lit fic or whatever, but... Yeah, that's what it is. It's a. I mean, lit fic is everything that doesn't fit neatly into a genre. Uh. Okay. But yeah, litfic. I mean, not to be reductive, litfic is basically asterisk other. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, all those stories about about uh, poor abused girls um, growing up into strong, independent women. I consider all that misery lit. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's what it felt like to me. Um, but that said, I mean, it wasn't like it was poorly written. It just didn't do anything for me. But I, I also like. I'm yeah. I'm glad that it was a short part of the book. Mm-hmm. I think like you said, a- important to his character, but definitely was, not it, not it transitions into my favorite part of the book. Yeah, yeah. the university. I love all of this, well, and I it's thought- it's really where Quoth starts to become Quoth. Yeah, he he stops. Yeah, that's that's exactly the case, and he kind of talks about that in the in the fiction he's like you know i i stopped being a person and started being just a survival thing where i just tried to do the best i could to make sure i was alive tomorrow um and then once he actually moves to the city and has a purpose in his life again like he he becomes an interesting character again i thought it was interesting how they dealt with his poverty and how they talked about how expensive um paper is and you know, all those different little things, those expenses that, like, 
I feel like a lot of times in, in, um, in fantasy, you don't see that kind of stuff, but like fiber and paper, um, was very, very expensive in medieval times because it was mostly made out of fabric fibers like cotton or linen or, you know, those kinds of things. And so I thought that was really interesting that he brought that there, that it wasn't just paper pulp. It was like, you know, he, he was having to really consider how many sheets of paper he had for the rest of the semester. Um, that really stuck with me and how he couldn't afford another shirt because of how expensive that they were. I, I, I did, uh, I, I did get a little tired of it. Um, I, I, the book goes through what, like maybe three semesters or, or three terms at the college. Uh, yeah. and like in each one, he's like, Oh, I've, you know, Oh, I found the thing that's going to be how I get my money to get it, you know, to pay my tuition for next, uh, for next term. Oh no, something happens. And I, now I don't have access to that money. <laughs> it's, so like that got, that got, uh, really formulaic. Like it wasn't a surprise when, you know, it's not a surprise when the protagonist runs into a hardship. Right. But like, you know, running into the same type of hardship, you know, multiple times, it's just like, it's, it's not surprising. Like, okay, I'm not, you know, he found some money and now he's, uh, now he's playing, you know, he has a new, uh, what was the instrument that he had? Loot. Loot. Right. So like he, he bought a new loot and now he can play for money because he's really good at it. Oh, but, ne- but you know, now something happens and he's not going to get a wealthy patron. Like it, none of it's really like surprising. Yeah. And so it's like. Okay, like, that's not the... I, I understand he's going to have trouble, you know, paying for next term's tuition. Let's, you know, let's talk about other stuff. Let's find out <laughs> about him, you know, exploring the university. I'm, like, I'm that's... Fast. You get or that how too. he gets through his classes. Like, that, that's that's more interesting to me. I think Which there was a lot of that in the book, though. Yeah. I think it's fascinating how it's sort of a breakdown, almost, of, like, the going-to-school genre of learning magic. You know, I mentioned Harry Potter before, and I feel like that is a criticism that could be leveled at Harry as well. Oh, um, yeah. You know, every every book starts with, oh, what's the trouble that's going to keep him from getting to school on time this time? And then he gets to school, and what's the Voldemort thing that's going to get to him before the end of the year? And that, you know, is I don't necessarily think that that is, um, you know, a detriment to those books. I think that's you know but but they do follow that sim- similar structure and i think it's fascinating how quickly rothfa cycles through that he's like okay we're we're getting past this uh, you know it sucks every time let's just you know <laughs> he's like i'm going to tell you how it sucks but like you know it's going to suck <laughs> like we yeah already... he doesn't dwell on it so well and it it's also also like a foregone conclusion i think it's all i think it's like a tease of him getting kicked out of the university because he mentions that at the beginning of the book. Like he's like, mm-hmm. I got kicked out of the university before most people are allowed to even attend. So, and you're, so always, you're, you're just waiting. For yeah. It. You're like, oh, yeah. okay, is this going to be the time that everything goes to hell? Is this going to be the, like, it's, it's all of these like, <gasps> okay. and it, and you know, minor spoiler, it does not happen in this book. No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. One of those things no, that so. doesn't happen in this book. However, it is in the uh, it is in the uh, back of the book blurb for the second book that what? he like that he leaves the university. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean he mentions it, but I mean he mentions that at the beginning of the book. R- like, right. No. No. Yeah, and I'm saying like it's uh, it's like a description right away, like forced to leave the university. Is that forced so? to leave the university? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, something to that effect. I um... forced forced to leave the university. <laughs> what what is the significance of that, James? <laughs> I'm just saying forced to leave. Well, I'm not sure down. exactly what the description says. <laughs> no, um I I think am... James has read the second book. I've read about I don't know, James, how much of that book have I read? Not enough. Read the rest of it, damn it. Okay. I I've read I've read a good portion of the next book, and he's still in the university in the, my portion of the book. Yeah, and you quit for dumb reasons. You've still got like two thirds of the book left. Uh, it made me so mad I had to buy a copy to throw across the room. Get back to it. <laughs> Finish the book. Okay. Well, do we want to talk about why I 
why I'm so mad. <laughs> so on the topic of Denna. <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, let's talk about some of the uh, other characters other than Kvoth. Okay. So there's there's okay. So we've we've got we got Kvoth. Kvoth story you've wouldn't got be anything Chronicler. without a large supporting cast of of characters that are genuinely interesting and that we could learn to care about. Maybe. Except I, for Dinna, if you're Samantha. I care about her. I just don't like her. <laughs> and she just doesn't care for her. <laughs> No, I just want to stop a mud hole in her face, but that's neither here nor there. We can get so, there. There's there's Dena, the the possibly femme fatale of the series. She's a woman who has stolen Quoth's idiot young boy heart and uh, possibly doesn't even realize it, though likely does. She, um, okay, so um, she's like how old? I mean, he's supposed to be what, like thirteen or something? He's and when he he's uh, he's sixteen by the time he gets to the university. Okay, so yeah. she's like eighteen or twenty. Yeah, right? she's, she's she's a about couple a... years older than him. Yeah, right. So she's even even if her intentions are pure, she's still basically goofing with a little boy. <laughs> like I remember I'm... being twenty two and thinking, "Oh my god, sixteen year olds are babies." Yeah, at twenty two, at eighteen, it's still viable. But also at 22 in, you know, uh, late 20th, early 21st century America. Uh, okay. I mean... You, you, you know, I, I mean, Kvothe seems to be, for all intents and purposes, a legal adult. All well, right. and also Go keep in mind that he got friend-zoned pretty hard by Okay, let me, let, me, let me put it to you this way. Y'all identify with Kvothe, right? Like he's your he's identify your is a strong word. I love him. Okay, I mean, but he's like your your sir. Like if you're if you're meant to identify with a character in this book, like he's the one for you, right? Okay, sure. I'm I'm way more critical of female characters in male led books because because I'm a woman. I mean, I know that sounds really trite, whatever. But like, it's not that I can't identify with both, but like my ability to relate to the emotional reactions and the like physical reactions of, of female characters is stronger because I am one. <laughs> so I think I never knew that. Of, is it because she's the most poorly written character in the entire book? I think I think I don't know that if she's that is, the most poorly written. I, I am forgiving of the that because I could see why where you would be criti that criticism being accurate. But I think that she's poorly written in quotes because it's Kvothe who is in love with her telling us about her. She has no flaws, but she also doesn't have her own personality because he is so infatuated with her that she exists beyond her own self in his mind. So, like, to me, it's like a little boy talking about the girl that he has a major crush on, and that can be very tedious. Her actions are kind of belie her own personality in a way that his narrative narration is never going to get there i think it's deliberate i honestly do okay well well that that was going to be my next question do you think it's a case of how the character do you think it's a case of how the character is written or do you think it's a case of you know we're gonna find out other stuff about denna it, I like think we, it's we, the, we the reader are going to find out things about her or you know see her in a certain way that maybe Kvothe ne never does. I think it's an unreliable narrator situation. Okay. Yeah. Because but, I mean, they, I, I they keep buy, hinting at stuff. Yeah, and I, I mean... I, every time they hint at something, I think it's Kvothe who now knows the story, indicating that there's something deeper there. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's really interesting about how it's written, because even in the moments where I feel like there's something lacking in the narrative where he just glosses over something that either doesn't make sense or contradicts, I think it's deliberate. It feels deliberate. Like it's close saying, oh, no, 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 don't look at that. I'm misdirecting you to go look at something else. But like, you know, he's also telling a story that for the most part actually happened yeah. to him. And when you listen to how people talk about things, you know, you can intuit what's actually going on, even if they're trying to misdirect you. And I feel like, I feel I, like part yeah. of the reason why I enjoyed the book was because it felt like a memoir. 
like you could see that kind of stuff happening in the background. I, I I'll, I'll I'll walk it back. I don't think she's poorly written. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, especially if it is you know deliberate. Yeah. But she does, uh, I, I think she does have a lot of, at least in the first book, she has a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff he says about her, it, it she's like, almost a, you know, she's, to use a uh, archetype, right? She's almost a manic pixie dream girl. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. She's, I think that's partially She's why flirty, I... and she's flighty, and she's not going to be nailed down, and... And she's just the most wonderful thing with the yeah. purest heart. Now that said, <laughs> the actual, uh, it's more earlier in the book, um, the scenes of, so no romance really happens between them, but yeah. there's definitely like, you know, they're, they're obviously building to that point. Um, I think it's really well written, like that stuff is. As somebody who does not generally go in for you know, caring about the romance in, you know, books like this. I, I think it's actually well written and, uh, like, getting inside Fool's head when he's, like, especially, like, the first few meetings he has with her. Mm-hmm. Where he's, like, he has this meeting with her and, or, like, he has this, you know, what's essentially this date where he spends this whole night with her, uh, you know, walking and talking and everything's going fine and then the minute, you know, like, the minute he wakes up the next day, he's, like, replaying the whole thing in his head. Like, oh, my God. Like, did I say too much? Did I not say enough? Like, what did she mean when she said this? <laughs> like, I remember being a teenager. Yeah. And, you know, like, that's that's not that far off. <laughs> yeah. That in itself, I felt was really charming. I feel like... Mm-hmm. I feel like him as a narrator, he's self-aware enough to know, like... He's a bard. He's going to know how to tell an interesting, compelling story. But I also think he's putting on a performance about something that is actually really emotionally upsetting to him. So, like, there are those moments of humanity that peek through in his narrative. I think, uh, depending on what characters he's talking about, his tone shifts. Mm-hmm. Like, when he, like, when he's talking about um, um, Ari... You know, his, his the, the, the narrative just completely shifts to a completely different tone. He talks about her in, like, a paternal way about, you know, you've got to understand, you know, this this, this girl exists and she's special. And, and you know, I'm really, you know, she, he doesn't have an infatuation oh. with her. So it's not, like, rose-colored, but it's, like, you know, him trying to un- to make you understand how important she is. And then, like, Ari is his- great. Yeah, she's my favorite character. <laughs> yeah, she's she's like uh, she's definitely so. Ari is a uh, former student of uh, she's she's Possibly. one of the handful of former student a uh, handful of former female students of the university, um, and the university has a somewhat high rate of people kind of going crazy. They have like an entire. Um, they have an entire asylum. Yeah, asylum. <laughs> Associated so, to it. I, 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 yeah, at one point, both uh, Master, uh, the Master uh, Namer, who is a very weird, uh, weird guy. What's you his know, name, I James? love Aladdin. Yeah, he's he's great. He, uh, you know, he gives both a tour of the uh, of the asylum on campus, and it's like there's like three hundred something people there, and at any given time, there's like only maybe about twelve hundred students. Is it twelve or sixteen hundred students in the university? Something like that. Something like that. It's a really small university. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know. I mean, it's the university, but that's the extent of learning in this continent. Yeah. So it's uh, it's Uh, so people you know people messing with. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people messing with uh, these dark, or what you know, uh, some common folk would refer to as dark forces. Sometimes really do lose their minds and go crazy over it. And Ari, uh, that happened to her, but she kind of lives in the under thing, as she calls it. The, yeah, it's uh, basically cate- the sunken ruins of the, the old academy. Yep, it's the old university that this one was built on top of, as uh, Master Elodin says at one point. Well, and- Nate, you know that, that um, the supplemental book, Silent 
or silent regard, slow regard for silent things. Is that what it's called? The slow um, regard of silent things. Yes. Yeah, that's actually written about Ari. Wait, it's, what? It's her story told from her perspective. It's a, it's a short novel um, that that Rothfuss wrote about Ari. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you have that to look forward to. <laughs> I have that to order on Amazon right now. Yeah. I've actually not read it yet. Um, I don't know why. I just haven't gotten around to it. I d- I as much as I love these books. I I uh, I've seen it like you know in my like recommended you know books and all that. Uh, mm-hmm. I I thought it was like a collection of short stories or something. No, I- it started life as a short story that he had been asked to write on commission, and he decided to write a story about Auri, and it just kind of kept growing, which is a problem that I can sympathize with. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, he just, you know, he got back to him and said, "Hey, um." I'll take a rain check on the short story. I'll get you back for something else. This is turning into something real interesting. Oh, wow. So, yeah, you have that to look forward to. I think it's Like I said, I have that to order right now. Yeah, it's pretty widely regarded. Like, I think Ari is pretty widely widely regarded as the best girl. (laughs) She's she's great. I I really like... I I mean, honestly, her and Denna are the only... At least in the first book, are the only female characters who are fleshed out at all. I think that the um, the loan broker is pretty well fleshed out. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot Debbie. about her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm really interested in her. I think she's more interesting. Well, okay. Again, with the whole Denna thing, I'm not going to keep harping on this. I think that it is a lovesick person talking about their lost love, and so to me, that is that can be kind of tedious. Um. I think that's why she's characterized in a way that I don't find appealing. But um, all but the other you, characters... But you also think it's deliberate, which is... Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think, I think a key... I, I think that's a key thing to mention. Yeah, I think I think it's the narrator of the book. Like, in fiction, he's lovesick, and that's why he, she's characterized in that way. Because he doesn't want the chronicler to think poorly of his lady love. And so he's telling this story in this flowery way that... You know, to me, it's like, okay, okay, buddy, <laughs> you, she was out of your league. <laughs> like you did, you were, you were out, in over your head. Um, hmm. But uh, I, I think that there, there are some other characters who, who are pretty well fleshed out. Like, I think Elodin is really, really interesting and you don't get to see very much of him in this book. Not, not as much no, as I would like. You do get to see more of him in the second book. I, I would like to read a whole book about him, <laughs> but I'm, I'm into crazy can, wizards. I don't know. Can we, really... can we take a moment to appreciate one of the best scenes for him? Uh, and I, I believe it was in this book when they actually visit the, the asylum. Oh, yeah. And, yep. uh, yeah, and, and Elodine's like, you know, or, you know, Kvoth is like, what would you have me do to ha- actually get you to teach me naming? And uh, Elodine says... Okay, fine. Jump on the off of this building, and Quoth says, "Okay," and he jumps <laughs> off. He yeah, he he jumps off. He lands on his back, and he's like, <laughs> and he has a few seconds where he's like, "Okay, that's two broken ribs. I think I bruised my elbow." And he's he's like running down, you know, like the list of what he's hurt on he's himself, just done to himself. And Ellen and comes that- over, walks over, and looks down and says. That is the stupidest thing I've s- ever seen anyone do. <laughs> or, or, so, so you're or something teach to that me effect. naming? No, you're crazy. You just jumped off a building. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love it. I love that. I think I think that that's like such a such a great character moment because you know, like I, I don't know how you guys felt about it, but in reading it, I could feel in my my head like. Okay, I know where this is going. He's going to jump out of the window, and then Elodin's going to call the name of the wind, and like he's going to. Oh right, oh, yeah, yeah. The that's ground, exactly and, what and, I was like, expecting. You think that's all going to happen, and Elodin's just like, "Oh my god, you're an idiot!" And I loved it. I just was like, <laughs> "Yes, this is how every magic school should go." <laughs> should so always... this book, this book he's... in general is also a lot funnier than, oh, in say, a lot of modern fantasy. It, yes. it absolutely is. I and think a I lot was, of that goes you know, down I, to... I commented on that several times. Yeah, uh, to you guys. I mean, as Kvothe I was himself is 
he's he's Kvothe himself is just a blast to listen to you know as as a character he's got a very strong voice and a very clear personality and it's just so much fun to to have this journey through his head but then also like Aladdin is just straight up a subversion of the Gandalf yeah he's great he's perfect he's a perfect counterpoint to Kvothe because Kvothe is such like the story is always told about him being, you know, debonair and like getting one over on his enemies and stuff. And so, this other character who clearly is outclassing him in in the one thing that he really wants is, oh, yeah. I think, compelling. It's like that's the I, one thing that he wants. And and this dude like, got into the university at a younger age. Than, yeah. Then even Quoth did. He was. Uh, you know, he was he was promoted faster than Foth was. Yep. Or Which is at least promoted I, to uh, the highest rank of student. Yeah, I th- I think that's fascinating that there's like someone clearly who has outclassed him in every way, and like mm-hmm. I'm I'm fascinated by that character. <laughs> I, I, I could I could read you know a short story or a whole you know or a whole collection of short stories just about uh, Master Eladin. Mm-hmm. Or, or even better, you know, a collection of short stories. That, that's kind of what, like, fantasy authors do, right? They, they write yeah. these, like, long, long epics, and then on the side, they're also writing short stories. Or, yeah. or, or getting people to write, uh, you know, to write a collection of short stories in their universe. I so. don't see Rothfuss letting other people write his characters. <laughs> I, I, his I, don't, I don't either, but, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but yeah, like... A bunch of stories, like, from the university, tales from the university or something. I, I would yeah. totally be down for that. Yeah. Well, you could probably hit up an archive of our own and find a lot of erotic fan fiction, but... That's not what I'm into. <laughs> <laughs> you know, That's I not would, what I'm looking actually, for. Actually, <laughs> I would consider letting people write in, in my world. Well, okay. I don't think you're as nearly as much of a control freak, freak as Patrick is. Like, no, no, I mean, yeah, the the way that he, and you can tell by the way that he writes, but also I know this just from listening to him talk about his writing process, he labors over every individual word. Everything that he writes is extremely deliberate, and I could never write that way. It seems like it's a really hard thing for him, Like, like it's a difficult process, it, like, some writers, I think, make it look effortless, and I think that Patrick Rothfuss is clearly, like, this is a labor. And I, I'm, that's, not a, that's not a judgment on either method, but I just think, you know, there are, some people just make their, their creation process look so fluid and, like, look at this beautiful thing I've created, da-da, and then there are people like Rothfuss and, like, George R. R. Martin, who labor over it, and it's clearly like, you know, this is I, this is rolling Sisyphus's rock up a hill for me, and it's going to be done when it's done, that kind of thing. I know George so, R. R. Martin has uh, has put out short stories in uh, taking place, you know, in A Song of Ice and Fire. Is is he the sole author of those? I'm pretty sure. I don't okay. know that there's anything written in. in uh, Westeros that or whatever the if it's Westeros right I don't know no, well I mean yeah <laughs> yeah that, that I don't hasn't think the world itself him, has a canonically name. yeah yeah um, no I mean he's he's written there are comics adapting his work but I mean you know even uh, even is. the the characters that are not directly related to a song of ice and fire are still based on short stories that he wrote you know what never mind yeah I I just look it up there's a I because I, I know I've seen this in the store. It's called the Night of the Seven Kingdoms, and it's mm-hmm. a uh, yep. it's it contains uh, three no- novellas, but yep. they're all written by him. About yeah. Dunk and Egg, I love those characters. They're wonderful. <laughs> I don't know who those uh, characters are. I don't know. Dunk I don't know. George R. R. Martin's work is impenetrable to me. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Thank God for HBO, am I right? Uh, well, yeah. I can't be bothered, so... <laughs> we're we're watching the series right now, my wife and I, and, and as someone who has been a fan of the books for over... I think it's been about 12 or 15 years now. 
I actually do feel like the television series is the superior work. Whoa. That's interesting. But that's a different podcast, James. Yeah, yeah, that's a different podcast. So, anyway, uh, Let's I talk, think... Can, can we talk about close friends for a second? Because we've kind yeah. of touched on each of the characters. Will and Sim! They're the best, also. I, Will and I, Sim I, are I wonderful. both of them. I'm I I'm a combination of those two characters. They are my favorites. Like yeah. I I'm not a cool wizard. I'm <laughs> I'm a lame scribe or something. I know this, but <laughs> <laughs> I I I really like both of them. I I hope that nothing bad befalls them, which I, is also also. Partially... I always felt like the sim in my group. You know, a- any group of friends I was in, I always felt like the sim, and I always wanted to be the quote. <laughs> Yeah, don't we all? I think Quoth <laughs> wanted to be the Quoth, and he probably really wasn't. But, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What 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 did what was your takeaway, Nate? I I think it sounds like you really enjoyed it. So I I did. I've you know on this podcast, you know, even relatively recently, um, mm-hmm. you know, I finished uh, Sanderson, uh, Brand, uh, Brandon Sanderson's. The fir- the first book in uh, the Stormlight Archive, the Way of Kings, right? Yeah, that is probably yeah the yeah, one that so, you read. So like, I don't and know. you know, similar to uh, similar to the Name of the Wind, it has a magic system that is, you know, it has a world and you know a magic system that is very different mm-hmm. from you know traditional like high fantasy, um, which. You, you know, is interesting, and, you know, everything is, I feel like that's a thing that's happening a lot these days, is, like, things are trying to be different from, you know, Tolkien's uh, version of high fantasy. Right. Right? Like, even, even you know, even uh, Game of Thrones is that, to some extent. Mm-hmm. You know, trying, you know, it's trying to be different and all that, and uh, I think... I think it can, you know, I think sometimes fantasy authors can try to be very different, but it's obvious that they're trying, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I get you. I've, I've read some books like that. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, Sa- I think Sanderson, uh, I think Brand- uh, Brandon Sanderson to some degree and Path- uh, Patrick Rothfuss to a much more degree, you know, a much higher degree, uh they're really good at crafting worlds that are not typical fantasy and that feel, uh, that feel very well thought out, um, very well fleshed out and that feel like they're not trying to be different for the sake of being different. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of what helped, uh, Rothfuss in this particular case is that this is a world that predates the King Killer Chronicles. He's mm-hmm. he's worked in this world before. He's run role playing games for his friends in this world before. Okay, I was you know, not aware is, of this that. This is a world that existed prior to. I don't know if it was prior to Quoth, but it was definitely prior to these novels. I think okay. that's such a good thing, though. Like making a used world is is it can be a laborious task. So like the fact that you know as a as a person who dms i know that you've got to write that world bible you have to have you know lore at your fingertips for your players so i can completely see that this world must have been built in that way that you know i i you build you build it with building blocks that you've taken from different places and you make it into something that's your own and then you end up with this tome of lore (laughs) as a as a dm uh i definitely have at least a couple of those so, like, I, I can definitely see that. I would love to see his notes for his role-playing games based on this <laughs> world. Yeah. Like, so, so that, that would be fascinating to me. Did he make his own role-playing system, or... Oh, I don't how, know. Do you know, actually, has he, like, talked I, I about I don't this, actually or? know. Okay. Um, I've, I've only heard him talk about it in very, very limited terms. Yeah, okay. he does a podcast with <clears throat> Max Temkin, um, which oh. I don't like Max Temkin, so... I right, didn't listen to yeah. his podcast, but, <laughs> um, huh. but yeah, it, it's it was interesting to listen to. I listened to the episode where he was talking about, um, which I I don't know if you know this, you probably do, Nate. That uh, there, it's been uh, um, picked up for adaptation. Was it movies or 
movies, I believe. I, I actually didn't know that, no. Yeah, um, and he talked about how Lin-Manuel Miranda is attached to it, and he said, and Lin said wow. to him, I want to be the president of the Don't Fuck This Up committee, <laughs> which I think oh, is wow. pretty great. Um, Lin is like a huge fan uh, and is interested in writing music, but also being like a story um consultant to make sure that they don't fuck it up so i have yeah, pretty actually going to write the music for the the series yeah which i think is great i i i think that a, a series that has such a deep musical root is interesting did they did they have any like music on the um book on tape that you listened to uh they no. did not no yeah. they didn't which which, which which seemed like a real missed opportunity honestly so yeah uh both is a um he was part of the uh, Edema Ru, which is basically a very elite band of traveling, uh, wh- what would they be called? Minstrels? Minstrels, yeah. 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 Um, and, and they're treated, uh, basically they have like the backing of a wealthy lord. Uh, and they go around and they uh, entertain, you know, small towns in the, you know, part of the world that they're from. Or part of the country that they're from i guess and place it like towns will take them in and like you know see them perform but at the same time they're really like mistrusted mm-hmm. that, that, that that was uh that you know that was a thing in the beginning of the book um yeah. that's how both grew up so that's why music plays such a big role and there are i actually really liked that there were you know songs and they didn't just say oh i sang a song like He, you know, they talk about, you know, a lot of the songs when they talk about them, they actually, you know, Rothfuss took the time to write out lyrics for these, you know, he wrote out lyrics for these songs that are telling a, you know, that are telling like a legendary story in this world that he crafted, which I think is a really neat way of, you know, conveying like the history of the world. Without getting uh, without getting bogged down and just no uh, yeah where, where it's not just like exposition like ten thousand years ago this happened it's really interesting and also like a lot of the songs rhyme and stuff and it, they come off as being more interesting and less pretentious than the songs in say Lord of the Rings. I in Lord of the Rings I definitely would just skip them. Yeah, like, I just wouldn't oh, even bother to read them. They were and they're awful, awful. <laughs> I, I wonder if listening to this book on tape, because I read it. I think we've talked about this, but I sat down at like 7 o'clock in the morning one day, one Saturday, yep. and read it completely through in one sitting Yeah, um, and, until like 9 p.m. that night. Um, I think that a lot of that stuff may have also kind of just, you know, my eyes kind of gloss when I see poetry in fantasy novels <laughs> but i wonder if listening to it as a as a book you know like as an audiobook would kind of give me a better appreciation for those moments um you know for those songs because they didn't make an impression on me at all in the in the book so no i thought they were really good yeah uh yeah. james i know you both read and listened to this uh yeah typically speaking anymore um since it Because of how busy I am, it takes me so long to get through stuff. So if I want to go through a book again, I will typically pick it up in audio uh, for my second go-around. So I ended up grabbing those uh, again on Audible. And This podcast is not sponsored by Audible. Yeah, this... this, But But hit us up, uh, yo. (laughs) Amazon, you know, Bezos, if you want to... You want to make some some of that sweet rocket punch money. We'll do it. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you all. Hey, our you want stuff. you want that rocket punch stamp of approval? <laughs> we'll be uh, we'll be happy to put that somewhere. You know, on a piece of paper. Uh, you know, on on your body somewhere. You know, maybe we might be willing to do something for you. Uh, you know, uh, Bezos, hit us up. Uh, we might be able to work a little something something out. You know, bada bing, in, in all bada seriousness, boom. I wish I'd started listening to audiobooks years ago. Because I I have this awful habit of, like, picking up a book and just, like, getting bogged down in the middle of it. It's so much easier when I can just listen to it for an hour when I'm going to sleep. I don't don't have that kind of willpower. 
<laughs> oh, oh my god yeah or like you know or i can listen to it a lot of times uh you know i can listen to it um if i keep the volume low i can listen at work and stuff and when i when i first got my car or my rather when i got my first car um it had a tape player in it because i'm an ancient old hag what's a um, tape i know but i i would get books on tape from the library and it would be 1030 at night. I had just gotten off work from the grocery store and I'd be sitting in my car listening to Stephen King on tape, uh, terrified to go in my house, but also unwilling to press stop on my <laughs> tape player <laughs> because I, I was terrified to cross the yard to go to the front door, but I also couldn't stop listening. Um, I can't have books on tape are tough because I will binge them. And just like I binge read, like, if I start a book, if I have, you know, enough time to get through a couple pages of it, it's, forget it, my afternoon's gone. I have such, so little willpower when it comes to getting sucked into stories. Um, I mean, there point, are worse in. things to get addicted to. Yeah, it's uh, funny, because yeah. cause I, cause I, can, I can take or leave television shows, like, generally. I don't, I don't know, Nate, I mean, you know, JRPGs. Imagine, imagine how it would be for the nation's book addicts if we were to have the funding for libraries revoked. You'd have people out on the street scratching their necks, like you know, just another couple pages, man. I just, I need, I need a hit. I need my fix. I haven't, okay. I, you know, just ninety nine cents right. for an ebook, brother. James, hey, man. Hey, man. You, James, you, you smelled any good have, bindings lately, huh? We yeah, have man. A finite amount of life minutes on this planet, and if I want to get anything done with my life, I can't crack open every t a book every time I want some entertainment. Sometimes I need short form entertainment. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be trapped in my car forever. <laughs> <laughs> So that's where I live with books. Books and I have a have a, uh, a an abusive relationship. <laughs> I love them, but they punish me by making me read them for extended periods of time. Oh gosh, it's five in the morning again, and I haven't put this book down. That has happened to me more than once in my adult life. <laughs> well, I've done that with the audiobooks I've been listening to lately. Like, oh yeah, you know, just set it to play for an hour. Well, I haven't fallen asleep yet. Yeah, I guess I can play it for another hour. Book. Who? I don't understand people who read books before they go to bed. Well, like, the thing is... I can't do that. Like, actually reading a book before I go to bed, it'll put me to sleep every time. I no, used to do that, that. I should probably get back in the habit of doing no. that. If I start reading a book, like, 30 minutes before bedtime, I am not going to sleep that night. If I do it with Dresden... It's going to be a problem. You know, if, Jim Butcher has a tendency to keep me up just by virtue of the way that he paces his chapter breaks. But it, it doesn't matter for me. It's inertia. Like, if even if it's a book I'm not enjoying, I will finish it because I, I am driven by inertia. What, like so, that like, third Twilight novel? Have I read that third Twilight oh, novel? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you, you brought it home the night of release and you no, finished the whole damn thing from the, no, from Stem There's to no way. I've never bought a Twilight book on the night of release. I have read the first one because I got no, it at Target I, in paperback. I remember you having this conversation with me. It was tw I read Twilight in one sitting, but I bought that at, at uh, I I've read I read uh, all the Harry Potter novels. I would get them at midnight release, and then I would read them until early dawn the next morning. Yeah, you you uh, would do that with the Harry Potter novels, but but you. You I literally you, have you only read ever that read. Th you read that last Twilight novel no, like it was hate sex or something. I literally have this conversation never read has taken anything. an amazing turn. I literally have never read anything other than the first Twilight novel. I no, did. I remember you going into lengths about the awful sex in that book oh, and the because, dumb name Renesme. Uh, that's because I read a, an extensive plot synopsis on it. That was written by someone who had done the thing. But no, James, I read the first uh, Fifty Shades of Grey novel late into the night because I kept wanting it to be better and it never got better. I did not finish that book, actually. I stopped about 70 pages from the end, but I was up until four in the morning reading it. <laughs> it made me want to die. So <laughs> I also did that with Gone Girl. I like started it. <clears throat> 
for a book club and I read it and then I, I read it until like 6 a.m. Like until it was done <laughs> because I was so mad I had to finish it. So yes. No, James, I literally have never read this the second or third Twilight novels. Okay. All right. I, pr- I promise. I definitely uh, okay. do not do it on release night. That That is some <laughs> slander that I will not stand for. <laughs> This is but we've managed to go pretty far afield from the king killer himself. So, uh, Rocket Punch Radio is a giant wizard podcast fighting force designed to beat back the evil Duke Jackus and his oh, army of God. being an asshole. Oh, thank God we didn't talk about that piece of shit. We would never stop. Fucking Ambrose. You can join the Rocket Punch Corps by hating Ambrose. And listening, to, reviewing us wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah, just just write in your review how much you hate Ambrose, and we'll we'll be super happy with you. Jackass and Jack you is, also... is my is probably one of my favorite <laughs> yes, chapters in Jackass, a fantasy novel Jackass ever. Was a very good part of that, but guys, we're already in the atro. We can't get back into this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can also check us out at rocketpunchradio.com or on Facebook in the Grown Ass Geeks Facebook group. Our theme song was composed and recorded by Brent Black at brentblacktunes.com. This podcast was produced by Samantha. Say hello, Samantha. Hello. And our artwork was created by Jay Garcia of Audio Visuals. You can find us on Twitter at Rocket Punch RDO and also on YouTube, where we post Let's Plays, podcast episodes, unboxings, and now a reaction video. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> what is our life, James? Ladies and gentlemen, where can people find you on the internet? You can find me on PlayStation and Twitter at Blade of Creation. Hey, uh, Nate, why don't you live tweet the next book? Do you know how yeah. long that'll take? Yes. <laughs> but it this, book, this book was like 24, 26 hours. I think it was 26 hours uh, audio book. I already looked at the next one. It's like 42 hours. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? It'll entertain If I, if I want to listen to a book for 42 hours, I'll just listen to the next Brandon Sanderson novel. <laughs> You'll enjoy this one more. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Kababalon. <laughs> I won't live tweet my my evening uh, my uh, overnight uh, reading sessions because I can't stop reading. That's that's just it's it's a problem. James, you'll where have can we to, find you'll you have now? to have John kind of... there live tweeting it. Yeah, for I I had a web address uh emergency and so now you can find me on my new home on the web at jpatrickallen.net where you can find out all the information about the dead west series including the information on the newest book released two weeks ago bond of blood it's now available for sale on amazon in ebook and paperback and also on the 18th wall website in ebook form for any reader of your choice um, you can find me on Twitter at jpatrickauthor, and uh, I am a fallback girl as long as you are not a brand manager or looking to help me with my marketing, or uh, if you're not a cam girl. I don't follow back to any of those three groups. Uh, have you seen that cover, Nate, for, uh, for Bond of Blood? Don't you want to uh, know who that mysterious woman is? <laughs> yes, I do. She's pretty awesome. Okay. I, I also don't know wait, read my book. Actually, I need to uh, check it out. James, read my I books, did start Nate. reading your book. I am currently 7% of the way through it. Good 7%. job. 7%. Excellent. Yeah, it's, that's it's like a, a page. Its beta working title was Bonds of Blood, so that's what the title is for me for the rest of my life. I'm sorry, I'm old. It's what the title and is for me, too. I can't, I can't un-S the Bonds. No, I but... get you. I get you. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Okay. (laughs) That's all. That's it. That's everything. Goodbye. (laughs) Good night. Good night.